And he says, well, pray. And it was the right answer. You know, pray. Lord, help me to become useful. But before I can become useful, I've got to be prepared. You know, what use am I if I don't know nothing? Okay. You know, so uh, we are saved by grace. Just as those Gentiles were back then, they no longer have to qualify by becoming Jews or by becoming perfect in order to qualify. We don't have to become perfect in order to qualify. We qualify now. At the beginning of the ages to come, He will make us perfect. The Jews had to behave themselves, and then they got to be brought in to the kingdom at the end of the ages. For us, we qualify right now by faith. And then, at the end, when He takes us out of here, He'll make us perfect. So it's the other way around. As Gentiles, we don't have to be circumcised. We don't have to obey the law. We don't have to tithe. I was talking to somebody the other day about how neat it is in this little organization that we never talk about money. And yet our bills are paid for. Thank you, God. Yeah, that's, that's neat. And that was our whole idea from the beginning. Let's see if we can trust God like all the religious organizations are supposed to be able to do and see what... what uh, if, if he provides. Or if he decides to shut us down, then he shuts us down. That means he's through with us. He's, he's used us enough, and now he's going to use somebody else. We don't have to fast. We don't have to provide sacrifices. Amen. And neither do the Jews today. Somebody asked me the other day about Messianic Jews. That's just another Christian denomination. And the sad thing is they distinguish themselves just like the other denominations do by calling themselves Messianic Jews. In other words, we're Jews that happen to believe in Jesus Christ. And this other one says, yeah, but I'm a Baptist who believes in Jesus Christ. And one says, yeah, but I'm a Presbyterian. No, but I'm an Episcopalian. So they're showing how they're different and in their minds better than the other Christians. Instead of we're all together in Christ, we're all apart by the little group that we began, that we belong to. So, the final sacrifice has been made. All we have to do is believe in Him instead of ourselves. So they came in great multitudes to hear what Paul was saying. But that didn't please the Jews. Let's go back to Acts chapter 17, verse 5. Acts chapter 17, verse 5. Where uh, the Apostle Luke, who's writing this to us, tells us, But the Jews which believed not, in other words, they didn't believe in Jesus Christ, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. In other words, no good nicks. And gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. So, they, they got everybody stirred up against Paul and Silas, and Paul and Silas had to kind of sneak out by night. And that's why Paul writes back to the Thessalonians. That's why we have this letter to read as soon as he gets to Corinth. When he get down here to Corinth, that's where he wrote back to the Thessalonians. That's why he wrote all his epistles, is because there's still so much that they had to learn. He had only been there three or four weeks. A lot of Christians got about three or four weeks worth of knowledge their whole lives long. Mm -hmm. You know, that's about how much time they've spent studying. Well, he knew they still had a lot to learn, just like we Christians have a lot to learn today. So he wrote these epistles to fill in what was lacking. And that's the same thing with us. Uh, and, and I told you before, in the case of the epistle to the Romans, who he had not gone to see yet, to spell out the whole doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ according to the mystery. That's what it's for. But he wanted us all to read all these letters. Because for us, they furnish us. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Okay. 
where uh, Paul tells Timothy, and thus through his letter to Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete in his understanding, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So they thoroughly furnish us to perfection in Christ and all good works. Let's go back to Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1. One to three. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. So he's giving thanks, praying, and remembering. Paul is so excited about new growing believers and the fact that he was given the privilege of planting the seed in those believers. And now he wants to water them or give them more information. It's kind of like the good news that you shared, Sharon, about some people that want to start a Bible study and start passing this information on to some other people. That is just so exciting. It really is. You know, that's, that's just uh, amazing. So, all right, let's read verses 4 and 5. Knowing, brethren, he goes on to them, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So what he's saying, remember that you got a gospel that was more than words, but also of the power to transform you through the Holy Spirit. He knows that they've now joined the elect of God because he can see it in their faith and love and patience. That's what he's telling them. What is he starting to see when he sees that? Excuse me? The growth, but the evidence is the fruit of the Spirit. He's seeing the fruit of the Spirit start to come out. Remember, we're told that that fruit is something that the Spirit produces in us. So when you start seeing somebody growing and more fruit is starting, they're becoming more loving, more patient, uh, more hopeful, then you know that there's something going on inside. Mm -hmm. And so that's the fruit of the Spirit. And what does the fruit of the Spirit confirm? That the Spirit's in there. Mm -hmm. Because if the Spirit wasn't in there, there'd be no fruit of the Spirit coming out of them. And if the Spirit's in there, what does that confirm? They're saved. Because when we believe, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us. Okay, so let's read verses 6 and 7. He says, And ye became followers of us, he's talking to the Thessalonians, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, those were tough times. Remember, Paul and Silas had to get out of there by night uh, with joy of the Holy Ghost so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. So remember how much turmoil there was when Paul was preaching to them. Yet he's telling us here that they received it with great joy as a result of the Holy Ghost. And that is one thing we can have if we really understand it, is great joy even in times of turmoil. You know, we can stand firm in the Lord. The whole world can be falling apart behind, around us, but we can stand in the Lord. And again, he mentions faith, love, patience, joy. That's fruit. That's why they were such good examples to those around them who believed. 